It's lovely to meet you all and thanks so much for inviting me to speak today, um, Karen and David and Jane particularly. I'm going to spend about 20 minutes going through um, the Victorian Fetal Alcohol Service just with an overview and a little bit about what we do. I am representing the, um, the whole BICFAS team. So whilst I'm speaking, it's not really just me, it's um, representing effort that's gone into this from a number of different people. So I'm head of the developmental and paediatrics team at Monash Children's. Um, but I come to FASD with a background of working in this area and with these children for about um, 20 years as a clinician, in, initially in Northern Australia and Northern Queensland particularly. And I recognise that whilst my talk is mainly focused on a Victorian service, hopefully it's a general approach that will inform people who I know are watching from um, interstate and also outside Australia. So we were fortunate to um, receive funding from the Department of Health in the Australian Government in 2019 to start a clinic. Um, the, a diagnostic clinic, which is really based around the National FASD Strategic Action Plan umbrella. That's the, the, um, the priorities and um, alignments that we're working towards. It's Monash Children's Hospital based, but in fact, it's a statewide catchment. So the VicFAS team is um, a number of us. We've got speech, OT, neuropsychology, paediatrics, social work, and we're fortunate enough to have a teacher from the school at Monash Children's School join us, as well as administrative support. Whilst this might look like a whole lot of people, in fact, we're all very fractional in terms of EFT, so it's quite much smaller group than it may appear. Um, and they're a terrific team to work with. What do we do? Well, there's a number of activities through VicFAS. The core um, assess, core function really is the clinical assessments, and that's diagnostic assessments by our multidisciplinary team. We do regional outreach three times a year when we're permitted to do so by um, the Victorian government and by COVID um, to go to travel to um, areas such as Gippsland, Northern Victoria, Bendigo, and out towards Geelong. And with those regional clinics, we have the terrific opportunity of meeting with local um, families and also working collaboratively with the clinicians and referrers in those groups. We have a large emphasis on training health professionals. And in fact, every year we probably train over 300 um, individuals. Some of these are more superficial in terms of lecture attendance, but some of them are very intense and we have constantly a range of um, trainee paediatricians, student doctors, and student psychologists coming through our team and assisting us with um, assessments. We're also um, keen to promote broader community awareness with FASD and also how FASD assessments can be integrated within the standard developmental assessments around the country. Secondary consults are something I'll touch on a little bit later. So who can come to see our service? Well, I would love to say that we would take every child, but there's a lot of children out there who require assessments and we're aiming to assess those that are most affected by alcohol. Our guidelines for referral criteria reflect this. So we accept referrals from paediatricians or child psychiatrists of children aged three to 10 years, and they're children who have severe complex developmental and behavioral issues. Um, although as Karen's said uh, spoken about already you do not need to have facial free um do not need to have um start again although um to get a diagnosis of FASD, you don't have to have confirmed prenatal alcohol exposure if you've got facial features in our clinic we do require that as a referral criteria and that makes it just that much more likely that we're um, targeting the children who are most likely to be affected interestingly of our referrals all of them are in the high risk alcohol intake group. Referral criteria also include that um, the child must live in Victoria. So we've got, um, whoops, hang on. Just go back a slide. We've got a number of areas of referral around Victoria with particular focus around the Gippsland area at the moment, um, where we've got some really interactive clinics um, and also metropolitan um, referrals broadly around um, Melbourne, but understandably initially focusing 
on the um, southeast region where Monash is, but also branching out now into different areas, which we hope to promote. We've had a look at the patterns of who is referred to VicFAS, and there's some interesting findings. There's a disproportionate increase in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are referred to our service. And whilst in Victoria, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders make up nearly 1% of the population, in our referral base, the children represent 46% um, of the children that um, are coming into our service. Similarly, in terms of out of home care representation, the number of children with DFFH involvement and out of home care is 82% and an additional 9% once you look at those without the out of home care. This means that when we're working with these families, there's a degree of complexity required even in the logistics um, and processes such as obtaining informed consent. Now, alcohol is a teratogen. Alcohol, a teratogen is a toxin that affects the developing fetus. And as um, Karen quite rightly said, the effect of the alcohol depends on a number of variables. It might depend on when in the pregnancy the alcohol is consumed, how much alcohol there is, and then other factors such as the mother's health uh, or other medical issues that might be going on. And this affects a number of domains. We know that alcohol can, can um, affect growth, leading to smaller children. Um, birth defects are so affecting different parts of the body, including the heart, um, the kidneys, etc. But in terms of the Australian diagnostic criteria, which is a guideline that we are diagnosing children under, and that was created in 2016, um, we look at these areas. So we look at facial features, consider alcohol consumption, and then look at the effects of alcohol on the developing brain, specifically in those 10 domains um, that uh, Karen's mentioned that I'll go over again. So this is what informs how we run our clinic. We look at those areas to inform, does this child have FASD as part of what they're, how they're presenting? So we've got, we've got four stages to our clinic process. There's the intake, there's pre-clinic workup, there's clinic week, which is the most visible part. Um, and then there's the reports and feedbacks, and they're all really important. So during intake, we make sure that this referral meets our criteria. Has the, has the legal guardian and the carer consented? Sometimes that takes a little bit more digging. Is there definite evidence of prenatal alcohol exposure for this child in that pregnancy, or for that mother in that child's pregnancy? Now, those of you who work in this area will already know that that's a hugely fraught area to try and understand alcohol exposure. And our social worker, Prue, um, has a number of skills in terms of uh, using her detective um, skills to understand was this child exposed to alcohol and that might include accessing birth uh, records, um, documentation through child protection records um, and then looking at reports from um, family members etc and ideally from the birth mother herself. The preclinical workup is like the behind the scenes part. If this didn't happen well I don't think we'd actually get the kids in through the door at the clinic. Um, it enables the face-to-face -face assessment time to be successful and is tailored to what the family needs. So it's a case-by-case -case, um, modification. It might mean that the carer uh, has difficulty and with the questionnaires and needs assistance in reading and responding to those. It might mean that the regional family requires assistance with accommodation um, or transport. We've had one little girl who took a few attempts to even enter the hospital um, because she was so worried about coming into a hospital but with having a trial play run she managed to get in and then get a full assessment so um, the preclinical workup is is a important part of our process when we see a child for the assessment stage um, i see them for a medical assessment or my colleague dr connolly and we take a history do a physical examination um, and do all the things we would normally do when we see a child who presents with any neurodevelopmental disorder or autism, et cetera. We also take a good look at the facial phenotype and take photographs to measure um, the relevant parts. My colleagues um, do the neuropsychology assessment, which is vitally important, speech and motor assessment. So I'm describing a multidisciplinary team assessment, which is great. Um, and I fully recognise that this may not 
will not be present in many areas around Australia. Um, and I can speak later, perhaps even in question time, about what do you do when that's not, not available. So whilst the majority of children with FASD do not have the three facial features of FASD, which as you probably know, is a thin upper lip, a flat filtrum and short eye spaces, palpable fissures. If the child does have all three facial features, it's highly specific for FASD. There's not many other things that mimic all three facial features. With my examination physically, I'm also doing things like examining their heart, their lungs, measuring their head circumference, um, and the particular relevance of that is ensuring whether or not they have a small head, because we well recognise that alcohol can affect the developing brain, not only in function, but also in size. So a number of children with FASD have small heads. The next part of the assessment is looking at the um, other domains of development. So these are areas of development, motor, cognition, language, academic achievement. You understand what those are. Memory and attention testing directly and by questionnaires. And then these mysterious terms, which took me ages to understand, executive function, so reasoning and judgment, uh, impulsivity and control, impulsivity control and hyperactivity. Affect regulations, looking at mood, anxiety, depression, and adaptive behaviours, looking at daily living skills from can this child self-toilet or um, self-care in terms of showering and dressing when it's appropriately um, that age level. Social skills and social communication are also assessed. Now we've been um, had the interesting challenge over the last 18 months of starting a new clinic and then fairly soon moving into COVID restrictions. So I'm incredibly impressed by watching the team, not just pivot, but pirouette to doing telehealth assessments for as much as we can. And that includes the medical part, but also a large amount of the speech and neuropsych assessments. ROT has even been able to video people running and um, review those motor skills um, subsequently to the, um, as part of her assessment. If it's not possible, we will bring the child in at a later date when face-to-face -face is possible. So as a result of all that, um, we case conference and then get together to try and work out what's going on. Not every child who comes to our clinic gets a diagnosis of FASD, but they all get a good assessment and they will get a great report outlining their strengths and difficulties and then feedback to the carer as to where to next. This slide reminds me of a patchwork quilt and a child or a person with FASD doesn't just have FASD. There's always stuff that's going on as well. And some of these other issues, such as motor skills, background, um, intellectual disability, a background of trauma or primary mental health issues, coexist often, more often than not, um, some of them, with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. And they need to be taken into consideration, both as part of the differential diagnosis, are they the primary cause for these problems, but also as part of what we call the co-occurring problems or comorbidities. So it's important to have a robust clinical assessment of what else could this be, but then also what else is coming along with the FASD if FASD is present. So as the paediatrician, it's important that I consider what are the other causes of microcephaly, which small head, other than alcohol. Are there other reasons for facial features that may be present? Is there genetic reasons or structural brain malformations that might explain this child's behaviour? Abuse and neglect and trauma have overlapping symptoms, which we try and disentangle as best we can to understand the child and understand the etiology or cause of their presentation. And then other antenatal toxins are frequently involved as well. In trying to unravel the causes of the child's difficulties, we also do some testing. So not every child gets every test, but we usually do, do genetics on children who present to VicFAS. We also look at causes, you know, other background causes for things such as intellectual disability. Some children will get neuroimaging or brain scans. And if I hear a heart murmur in a child with FASD, I'll be much more likely to get an echocardiogram because I know that that child's at increased risk of having structural problems. Last stage, fourth, fourth stage is feedback and reports. So we provide 
uh, in-person or telehealth feedback to the carer with them encouraged to invite someone else who was important to their family to come along and listen. Um, and at that appointment, we talk about what this child is really good at and where they're struggling and where to from here. We also offer an appointment to the school teacher if that's what the carer and legal guardian want. And that's a really powerful way of the school being able to understand this child better. I apologise for the background noise, I can't stop that. Um, the school appointment is with a school teacher from our team and also with our social worker. Now I'm often, not often, but I make a point of discussing what the carer will speak with the child about and how they will explain their child's difficulties. Um, and if requested and it's developmentally appropriate, I'll speak with the child themselves about FASD and what that means to them. As a result of all these reports and feedbacks, one of the aims, and this slide is, um, I know the same as Karen's in a way, but I just wanted to reinforce the importance of it. One of the aims is to help the carer and the school understand that whilst they're looking at perhaps what looks like a 10 year old age child chronologically, there's multiple levels of their functioning. And it might be that physically they're actually bigger than a 10 year old, language skills they're an eight year old, and maybe when we measure their attention and impulsivity levels, they're functioning at a four year old level. And it's really important to think about that because if we were trying to cross, for example, a busy highway, we would take a four year old's hand and hold it firmly all the way across that four lane busy highway until we got to the other side because we would know they would not be safe to be crossing independently. Whereas if we see a 10 year old, we'd expect them to be able to know what to do and go off. And a child who has a developmental age equivalent much lower will fail in that task. Which brings us back to setting up these kids for success and making an environment where they're likely to succeed. So just to finish off, screening and referral guidelines. This is a slide from the Australian Guide for FASD Diagnosis. Um, and it reflects the research that we know um, pinpoints where high rates of FASD have been found across the world. So if you're working, you as clinicians are working with kids who are in out of home care, in contact with juvenile justice, have a family member who we know has FASD or a birth mum who's got alcohol um, dependence, or if they live in a community with those high rates of alcohol consumption, these are the children you might think, all right, well, this, this is a kid I need to get engaged more with services um, earlier than perhaps another child. Capacity building is close to my heart. I fully recognise that despite the fact that we've been able to get a startup service from 2019 for the last two years and see children in Victoria, there are massive gaps in our service provision. We are, there are people we are not seeing, there are age groups we're not seeing. Um, so I see the VicFast service and tertiary specialised PASD services as something that uh, is very helpful, but really just like autism diagnoses need to are available throughout community developmental PEDS and general PEDS, it would be great if we can train up uh, community paediatricians and community clinicians to have the same um, feeling of being comfortable in assessing and managing children who may have FASD. So with that in mind, we've started a secondary consultation program which works with paediatricians in the community who have a child they think might have FASD, but they want a little bit more assistance. So they send us a whole lot of information, we analyse it for them, we have a multidisciplinary virtual meeting, and then we give an opinion back to them that they manage it, they hold that child and that family. We have a lot of education and training opportunities for health professionals in the last 12 months. And there's been over 300 people trained to varying degrees of intensity, some with lectures, some of them as student paediatricians who um, uh, contribute to our assessments really closely um, and collaborate with our work. Teaching in the community is also important and members of our team work with um, teaching child protection groups. Um, there's been a recent contribution to the judicial lecture series in Victoria about FASD um, and also with school teachers across education. So just to bring it to a close, in summary, FASD is one of the neurodevelopmental disorders um, to consider when you as clinicians are seeing children with impairments. Local pathways 
to have these kids assess might include general developmental or specialised FASD services. And you might want to have a look at the FASD hub to see what's available in your area. But if there's no specialised service, then you don't give up. You just start doing what you normally do, which is try and understand this child's strengths and challenges um, and then get it, you know, aim to have someone called and earning the diagnostic opinion. Um, I find these children, kids with FASD, they're really active and engaging children to work with. So, you know, I'd encourage you to step forward and enjoy these interactions. Um, don't be concerned that you can't do it because you don't have particular specialised training. Whilst that's useful, you've all got your own areas of expertise which you can bring to understanding that child. And then lastly, helping a family with recognising and managing their child with FASD in an ideal world might assist in supporting a safe future pregnancy uh, for their sibling. And that is it from me. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, um, Katrina. If you can just stay there a minute, I thought we might do a quick question. I know this wasn't the plan, but there's been quite a few questions um, in the Q&A and I'll just remind everybody to pop your questions into the Q&A, not into the chat, because it's easier for us to filter through. But one of the questions that is coming up quite a lot is how do you distinguish between FASD and other conditions like ADHD or autism? Okay, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. So, look, I guess this is part of what we do all the time. So, you know, as a general paediatrician, if I get a rash, not me personally, but if I'm seeing a child who has a rash, I have to look at the features of the rash. I have to think of what's the possibilities, what are the attributes of the rash to make it, to attribute it to eczema or, you know, insect bites or something else wild and, and mysterious. So the concept of having to look at what we call a phenotype, which is what the child looks like, and it might be a behavioural phenotype, what are they expressing, how are they showing themselves, and then needing to pull it apart is familiar. And it's probably familiar to all you clinicians in some, in some ways. So, um, but, it, but it's not always easy. So we take, a, we take a detailed history and we try and tease apart um, what are this child, where, where do the symptoms come from? So, for example, with ADHD, we're expecting hyperactivity and impulsivity in a variety of settings in different ways that may or may not respond to stimulants. Um, if we have a child who is not developing because of trauma um, or neglect and they're still young, we expect that if they're in a safe, stable environment for a long time, and they don't have an external you know, cause such as an intellectual disability, their development will increase and they will learn new skills. So these are the type of things we take into account. Um, if the child has three facial features, it's much easier. So there's some objective findings that make it easy for me to say, look, this has to be FASD. If you've got three facial features and a small head, and we know you, your mother drank alcohol heavily in pregnancy, that for me is an easier um, question. But... Uh, so Karen, I guess I'm answering it by saying we consider the differentials in a way that I discussed with the slides earlier. We do some investigations sometimes and then we acknowledge that there is no, um, there is often comorbidity. So if I see a child with FASD, the majority will also have ADHD. FASD is an etiological diagnosis, it's the cause, whereas ADHD is just a description of symptoms. All right, um, if I can treat the ADHD within a child with FASD, that might help things along. It's not going to cure FASD. That's a long answer. It's complicated. Um, but I guess it, it's, it's, this is a difficult question and it's not taken lightly by our team. It's taken very carefully and considered over lots of hours of case conference. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Katrina. And I know that you're going to stay around for some questions a little bit later on, but thank you. 